أولنا محمد أنطقنا محمد آخرنا محمد صل على محمد آخرنا محمد ما عجب تقهر الارض وانت ساكن تراها في ما عجب يختلف القمر من تنور دجاها ما عجب تخجل الشمس وانت ما حيضيها اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي انزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاه والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش افضل الانبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عد إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعدة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful, and all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us this life and giving us the ability to represent Him on this earth as promoters of good and demoters of evil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with intelligence and the power of limited free will by which to exercise the trials and tribulations of this earth so that we elevate ourselves in the next world. For Allah certainly could have placed us in paradise in the next world, but then there would have been little value to ourselves, for then we would not have done anything to earn it. So when we earn something, we honor ourselves. As Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. Indeed, we honored the children of Adam. Such honor is given to us through free will, through our intelligence, and therefore we're able to decipher wrong from right and to be willing to have patience and to struggle with the difficulties and trials of this world. Now we might ask the question, why has Allah put us through such trials and tribulations? Some people get killed in the process of trials. Some people have difficulty struggling. I mean, you see outside some of the locals, you find them under very dire situations where they're so poor with such abject poverty that some cannot even get normal medical help where they end up getting amputated, having to suffer and struggle for the rest of their lives, not necessarily live long enough, but then you wonder what was the function and purpose of such a human being to come on this earth. Of course, this whole question, of course, demands a very deep conversation, but as a cursory conversation, those of us who are more privileged, it is obvious that we are the ones who need to help those who are underprivileged. That's just the law of nature. Allah has allowed diversity of economics and diversity of beauty, intelligence, so that there are transactions that take place. For if everybody had everything, then none of us would talk to each other. So we always have a lack of something and we always have something that others don't have. And it is our obligation to always give to those who need it most. You cannot achieve righteousness until you give with that which you love most. Allah says in the Quran. So the difficulty in this world, of course, we have to talk about it, and there are those who have moved away from Islam precisely because they feel that a good God should not allow evil to exist. And since evil exists, therefore God doesn't exist. This is a very basic, fundamental logic atheists try to use. But actually, it's a flawed argument because in reality, first and foremost, we agree unanimously, even with atheists, that were God to exist, he has to be all good. And I think that's wonderful. That establishes the fundamental fact that were God to exist, he has to be all good. And we have no difference of opinion in that matter. Where we differ with atheists and believers and theists is the fact that they reject the existence of God because evil exists. And it's an irony because evil really is a moral argument. It's a moral issue. It's not a scientific issue. 
morality cannot be deciphered nor adjudicated through empirical sciences. So you cannot study biology, chemistry, physics, and realize morality. Pure empirical sciences lack the ability to adjudicate morality. There is no halal and haram in pure science. Pure science is just physics, the way things are. The moral argument is on a much higher scale, which demands a higher being, which demands a certain structure, and this is where atheism falls apart. So tonight my lecture is on pluralism, religious pluralism. Is it religious pluralism or social pluralism? There are those who try to propose the idea, people like John Hick. John Hick was a famous contemporary who, who died, who believed in religious pluralism. Let me define religious pluralism. Essentially, they argue that every human being has some kind of a divine connection in religion, be it Islam, be it Judaism, be it Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism. They all have some level of connection with a higher authority, a divine system. And the religious pluralists argue that it doesn't matter how you approach God through your religion. At the end of the day, it all matters that we're all right from the perspective that it all ends up going back to God. This is the fundamental idea of religious pluralism. Essentially, then, the argument is that because there's a diversity of people in the world, 7.7, 7.8 billion people on earth, and there are varieties of religions, you know, probably 20 major religions, five the super major religions, and every human being has a different perspective on God. Therefore, they argue that because of this diversity that God has allowed, then they must all ultimately end up with God. And there's a problem with this, and we're going to talk about it. The second aspect of it is called social pluralism. Social pluralism implies people of various faiths living under one uh, governance, living together, coexisting. So you've got like in Dar es Salaam, across the street, you might have uh, you know, a Hindu temple. Behind you, you may have a Buddhist temple. On the other side, you may have Muslims of different schools of thought. And the diversity among us, and you go a little bit further, you have a church. And Christians and Jews and Muslims are all coexisting. So social pluralism essentially implies, can we all coexist under one governance? And does one religion have to dominate in order to manage the societies? And this is the second aspect. So within this brief time that we have of 35 minutes of conversation, I'd like to tackle this very quickly. It's a, it's a broad subject, but I hope it helps us. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. First of all, Allah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatih, Allah says, هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا He it is, هو الذي أرسل who sent رسوله messengers بالهدى with guidance ودين الحق in the religion of truth Okay, هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله so it supersedes all religions. So from the Quranic perspective, the idea of religious pluralism is categorically rejected. Quran categorically rejects the notion of religious pluralism as being correct, meaning all religions are essentially right. This notion is false. And Quran has many, many angles to this. You know, uh, so many. So to give you some examples, you find in, um, Surah Al Imran, for example. Allah says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ This is Surah Al Imran, verse number 85. Allah says, Whoever desires a religion other than Islam, it shall not be accepted. God will not accept it. غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ Meaning Allah will not accept it from him. And in the hereafter, they are losers. So then we may ask that, look, there are 7.5 billion people growing. In 20 years, we'll probably be 10, million, 10 billion people. How is it that the majority of people on earth that have the wrong religion will be condemned and Allah will not accept them? 
So I want to discuss this very briefly to understand, because this requires a lot of time in conversation, but for the sake of brevity, we need to make sense out of this. The fact that when Allah says he won't accept it, there's rationality behind it. That doesn't mean that the non-Muslims are doomed. Many of us assume that when Allah says, I don't accept anything other than Islam, meaning that non-Muslims will be doomed on judgment day, that's not true. What Allah is saying is that there is truth. Okay? Allah says, خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ Allah created the universe in truth. Our objective in life is to pursue the truth and to reject falsehood. That's the law of life. We notice that we admire truthful people. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam When he stood on the mountain of Jabal Abu Qubais and he told the people, the pagans of the time, if I tell you there's a caravan behind this mountain, will you believe me? They said, Anta Sadiqul Ameen. You are truthful, trustworthy. Sadiqul Ameen. That's the foundation of Islam. The foundation of prophets is that they spoke nothing but the truth. Qawl al-Haqq. They spoke the truth. Our objective in life as a human race is to pursue the truth within Islam and without Islam. So as a human race, our obligation when we talk to Christians, Jews, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, Hindus, whatever religion they may belong to, our objective is to speak the truth with them. There is no compulsion in religion. Allah in Surah Al Baqarah, verse 255, 256, Allah says, There is no compulsion in religion. Indeed, truth is clear from error. So the compelling factor is truth. Truth compels us. When a human being refuses to lie, it's not because they hold on to a particular religion. The fitra within themselves tells them that my conscience prevented me from lying. So therefore, I was compelled to speak the truth because lying is antithetical to my own existence. So Allah uses the argument that there is no compulsion in religion. Truth is already compelling. You and I are Muslims. That doesn't mean we're not compelled. As Muslims, we're compelled with haqq. And we're compelled to reject batil. We're compelled to submit to the truth. And we're compelled to reject evil and lies. We're compelled. But that's universal truth. You can talk to any human being from any religion. And they will unanimously argue with you that this is what we call the immutable truth. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ الدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ Maintain your faces upright. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا It's a system of God. فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا And Allah doesn't change His system. God creates His system universally and it never changes. لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ Sadly, in the Christian ideology, you find that 2,000 years ago, the laws of God changed a little bit. For mankind was doomed prior to that. And then when Isa alayhi salam came and he died on the cross, the laws changed a little bit. Now you had salvation and prior to that, there was no salvation. This is not the fitra of Allah. It's not the system of God. That mankind should be doomed at birth. Quran says, None bears the burden of the other. So certainly we cannot bear the burden of our predecessors. It's even in the Bible that none shall bear the burden of the other. But in Christianity, they're all bearing the burden of the supposed error, mistake of Adam. That's a violation of the fitra of God. These are the kinds of conversations we need to have with Christians, Jews, atheists, agnostics, on a very, very simple, basic rule where Allah says, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Say to them, bring your evidence if you're truthful. هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ Because Islam is the religion of truth, basic logic, that there is a truth. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now Allah in the Quran also says, in الدِّينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ islam the religion to Allah is Al-Islam. So let me define it briefly so we understand. 
Islam, al-Islam is a noun, it's a proper noun, meaning it's a system fixed. We know that. But none of us in this room totally observe the al-Islam according to the Quran. None. We're all struggling to improve ourselves. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, aminu billah. All you who believe, believe in Allah. Because it's a struggle. Every one of us may be born Muslims in this room that does not define the fact that we are perfect Muslims. That level of submission to Allah is a lifelong process. We all know it. There is Iman, there is Taqwa, there is Zahad. There are so many stages that a human being reaches to achieve greater certitude and certainty in faith. So we within our own religion are struggling to get closer to the truth. Between the schools, the five major schools of thought, our Shahadatain is intact. Our Qibla is intact. Our Prophet is intact. Our Quran is intact. But we're all struggling to get closer to the center. For the deen of Allah requires constant work. In fact, the Quran emphasizes the action and transactions of the Muslims to such degree that in Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah says, قَالَتِ الْعَرَابُ آمَنَّا the desert dweller, Arabs, say we believe. Qul, Allah is saying to the Prophet, Lam tu'minu, you don't believe. Walakin qulu aslamna. Walamma yadkhuli al-imanu fi qulubikum. Wa in tutiu Allah wa rasulahu. La yalitkum min a'malikum shay'an. Now listen to the verse. Allah says the desert dwellers say we believe. Because when they had just accepted Islam, early on in the stages when the Prophet was preaching Islam to them, they accepted it. But their ways were antithetical to Islam. They were not really following Islamic prescriptions. They had just done the shahadatain in armies. In armies. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ In armies. They became Muslims in armies. Thousands of people doing shahadatain together. It doesn't mean that they are good Muslims yet. Many of us claim to have Islam. We are born Muslims. But our understanding of the Quran is minimal. Our understanding of Surah Al-Fatiha, which when we pray 10 times a day, when you ask the majority Muslim population to define in their language, or even in Arabic, the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha, the majority don't know how to define it. SubhanAllah, it's amazing. We read it 10 times a day if we pray the five daily prayers. Many Muslims don't know the meaning of what they're reading. It's hieroglyphic. It's cryptic. How do we talk to Allah when we don't know the meaning of what we're saying? You know how important salah is? Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Wala dhikrullahi akbar. Salah keeps you from wrongdoing and evil. It is a great deed. It is a great ibadah. But the Muslim world is recycling. Does that put us under special protection according to the verse that Allah says the one who brings anything other than Islam he won't accept it or the religion to Allah is Al-Islam do you and I feel satisfied that yes I'm Muslim I'm, going, I'm secure no in fact the real essence of Islam is action and transactions for we in Muharram display that in Karbala the army that shot arrows at Imam Hussein salam, while the Imam was saying his prayers were supposed Muslims. Ibn Ziyad would start with Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. He was the biggest shaitan, but he started Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. What we call the most profligate, conspicuous hypocrisy in the history of human race, presented by the Umayyads. But they did the shahadatain. So did they get their protection on the day of judgment? That they will say to Allah, we did bear witness that you are God and the Prophet is the messenger of Allah. Today ISIS does that. They carry the seal of the Prophet on a flag and they behead people indiscriminately and murder people left, right and center. Is that Islam? This is the antithesis of Islam. But it's hidden under the garb of Islam. Which nifaq, in my opinion, according to the Quran, beyond any doubt, is the worst form of a human being, is a munafiq. Because that's the Trojan horse who comes within the garb of Islam, 
Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, protect me from my friends. For my enemy, I can protect myself. For it is within the boundaries of Islam where danger looms. So when we talk about religious pluralism, we must understand that every one of us on earth is struggling to get closer to the center. Those outside of Islam are further from the center. But what does it mean moving towards the center? Let me define it. You will find Islam is the religion of action and transaction. If you don't have actions or transactions, it's useless. Allah says, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ كَبُرَتْ مَقْدًا إِنْدَ اللَّهِ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why do you say that which you don't do? It is detestable to God that you say that which you don't do. For when we do, it is a testament to our beliefs. We can make many statements with our tongues, but it means nothing until we act on it. That's why Allah in this verse in Surah Jurat says, Khalatil Arabu Amanna, Ullam tu uminu. Say to them, you don't believe. Walakin qulu, rather say, we submit. Because submission is Islam. Aslamna, the same root word, salama, is mentioned in the Quran. Aslamna. Walamma yadhulil imanu fi qulubikum. Faith has not entered your hearts. Why? They did share the tain. To, for faith to enter, brothers, we need to act. We need to be honest. We need to be trustworthy. We need to be reliable. We need to have cognition of God. We need to understand our liabilities as a human race, that Allah will hold us liable on judgment day. If we don't have such beliefs, then iman will never enter our faiths. Then what does Allah say? وَإِن تُطِيءُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And if you obey and follow Allah and His Prophet, then your deeds will be intact. وَإِن تُطِيءُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ عَمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا Here, لَا يَلِتْكُمْ is mentioned. Your deeds will not be uh, erased. You know why? In the same surah in the beginning, Allah says, Ya ayu alladhina amanu, in surah al-Ujurat, la tuqaddimu bayna idillahi wa rasooli. Oh, you believe, do not go ahead of Allah and the Messenger. Ya ayu alladhina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt al-Nabi, wa la tajharu lahu bilqawli ka jahri ba'dikum li ba'din, an tahbata a'malukum, وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Opposite. Oh, you believe, do not raise your voices in front of the messenger. Perchance, your good deeds will be wiped out. لَا تَرْفَعُ أَصْوَاتَكُمْ فَوْقَ صَوْتِ النَّبِي You know why Quran is talking about that? It's showing submission. When you admire a prophet and when you revere him as a representative of God, how dare you raise your voice in front of him? Because when we raise our voices in front of people that we, don't, that we claim to respect, then our raising of voices is proof that we don't respect the Prophet. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So Allah says, if you are disrespectful to Rasulullah in action, then your good deeds will be wiped out and you won't see it. So that's why the Quran is saying, if you obey Allah and the Prophet, then your deeds will remain intact. Islam, therefore, is a religion that is pragmatic, practical, functional on a day-to-day -day basis. We come as Muslims, and I'll talk tomorrow, inshallah, about the importance of rituals, the rituals that we perform. You will notice, as a brief introduction today, if there is no cognition in the ritual, if there is no cogitation, as we say, reflection, tadabbur, tafakkur, tadakkur, then such transactions, even if they are very traditional, have very little meaning. It's sourced in Al-Kafi, it's sourced in the Quran, it's sourced in Nahjul Balagha. Quran is replete with that fact. Cognition, recognition, fikr. Inna fi khalq samawati wal ard, wa ikhtilaf al-layli wal nahar, la ayatin li ulil al-bab. الذين يذكرون الله 
qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim they reflect standing sitting and lying on their sides about the creation wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi as-samawati wal ard fikr action transaction honesty dignity this was the way of rasulullah this was the way of every prophet this was the way of ahlul bayt we admire them for that reason not because they have a title not because they were born muslims not because allah chose them as prophets allah tested them wa idib tala ibrahim we tested ibrahim we put him through much difficulty as proof that you have no argument on judgment day to say that we couldn't follow ibrahim allah says look how i tested him from childhood to old age i never stopped testing him as a sign that he is my prophet who is a prophet of action and transaction so in in a brief understanding here let's try to understand that there is the truth like in science when you study science and we empirically observe the universe we have theories is the universe expanding and contracting it's known as the oscillating universe is it contracting is it expanding did it have an origin was it always there thousands and millions of scientists are studying as we speak and they all come up with their own angles and their own theories but every scientist knows that at the base of all theoretical arguments lies the intrinsic truth that our theories will stand if they are in alignment with the truth if there is synergy with the truth it will sustain its trials and tribulations so no scientist as variant as they may may be in various angles in approaching their empirical observations would argue that their way is the only way but they all admit that there is a natural truth that everything moves towards that analogy is islam so while we struggle allah has completed the religion for us and let me make a quick footnote on the side here as muslims i grew up in the western world and i hear this often and i correct them often they say judeo christian islamic i say what do you mean by that well they say you know among the abrahamic faiths islam is the youngest of the abrahamic faiths it's 14 centuries old christianity is two you know uh uh 20 2000 years old judaism is even older that's a misstatement that's not true this statement is false it implies that 14 centuries ago a man in mecca cooked up a religion called islam and prior to that there was no islam this is ludicrous this is a false statement so be aware of that whenever somebody says among the abrahamics it's the youngest excuse me i beg to differ my first prophet is adam even judeo christian do not believe in adam as the first prophet they believe him as the first man but they do not consider him the first prophet of god we within our deen consider him to be the agent the khalifatullah on earth so our religion originates as intelligent beings although the religion al islam has always been with allah forever before even the earth existed but when the human race came and the the islam the humans have to follow it came with the first human being adam alayhi salam so the original religion to god is al islam salawat ala muhammad wa ala muhammad In fact Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Hajj verse 78. Allah says wa jahidu fil lay haqqa jihadi wa ijtabakum wa ma ja'ala alaykum fid din min haraj millata abikum Ibrahim huwa sammakum al-muslimin min qabl wa fi hadha. Quran is very clear. Struggle in the way of your Lord the way he deserves it for he has chosen you. Allah is talking to us. Wa ijtabakum and he has not made religion difficult wa ma ja'ala alaykum fid din min haraj religion is not difficult we have twisted it and made it difficult the religion of allah is not difficult wa ma ja'ala alaykum fid din min haraj 
Millata Abikum Ibrahim. Islam has many names. One of them is Millata Ibrahim. When you say, which religion do you follow? You say, I follow the religion of Ibrahim. It means you're a Muslim. Quran states it. When you say, you follow Ibrahim, means you're a Muslim. Hanifan Musliman. So Allah says, Millata Abikum Ibrahim. They were called Muslims before. And now. You are also Muslims now. Islam did not come 1400 years ago. It came with humanity. So please understand that. So we ask then in that case, why are there thousands of other religions? What happens is when, it's like Chinese whispers argument. Okay, a brother on this side has the truth. He whispers to the next brother. And the next brother whispers to the next brother. By the time he reaches back there, it's another story. It's called Chinese whispers. So when prophets come with the truth, people twist it a little bit. They add a few spices, you know. They remove some things. They add some salt and pepper. Change the flavor. Before you know it, it becomes a different religion. It takes a different madhab. It takes on a different form. And then people insist on following that form. But before you know it, you've got thousands of variations. And you're wondering, where did these variations come from? Did they originate from truth? Yes. They all came from truth, but they got twisted. You know, when I talk to Christians, they say to me, there's a striking resemblance between Islam and Christianity on many fronts. And they accuse the Holy Prophet wasallam for having plagiarized or taken from Jews and Christians. It's an irony because Isa alayhi salam preached in temples of the Bani Israel. So why don't the Jews accuse the Christians of having taken from the Jews? It's funny. <laughs> By the way, Isa alayhi salam never preached in a church in his life. There was no church in his life. Church came way after him. Just to understand. This notion is is, is let's say, begging the question. It doesn't make any sense. When people say there's a resemblance, it's because the religion of God is one. It originates from the truth. So the roots have to have similarities. That when you go to Jews and Christians and we talk about Yusuf alayhi salam, we have so many similarities about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. So many similarities of Musa alayhi salam, freeing them from Pharaoh, taking them across the sea. These are very similar in the Abrahamic faith. That doesn't mean one concocted or plagiarized from the other. It implies that there is a system of God that is true, that took diversions over time, and therefore we believe Christianity diverted from the truth. For in the Bible, Isa never says, worship me, I'm God. Never. He says, why callest thou me good? There is none good but that which sent me. Why do you call me good? They said, Jesus, thou art good. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is no good but the one who sent me. When Lazarus was dead, if Isa was God on earth, why is he praying? He prayed. You know, when Christians ask me this question, who do you worship? I said, I worship the God of Jesus. Oh, wow. I said, you remember when Jesus bowed? He bowed to that God? That's the God I bow to. Oh, wow. So we're similar. I said, yeah. I said, Jesus bowed. He prayed. Our imams used to challenge that question. If he is incarnate God on earth, who is he praying to? So you find biblically, this notion came later on. The idea of a Trinitarian God came later on, centuries after. It took on its roots. Even the cross, which the Christians have, was never in the time of Isa. It was brought by Constantine, the emperor, 300 years after. He had it in a dream. It's a very central symbol of our Christian brethren. But we find that it took a diversion. In Judaism, same problem. You know why the Jews were in Medina? The Jews, Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Quraidah, they were all in Medina. You know why they were there? Because their scriptures say the Messiah, the Redeemer, shall come in Medina. And they used to taunt the Arabs the Arabs of Medina were known as the tribes of Aus and Khazraj, who then united to become the Ansar, who welcomed the Prophet. You find that they were taunting the Arabs of the time to tell them that soon our Messiah is going to come. And when Rasulullah shows up on the map, 
They question him from head to toe and he answers exactly what the preceding prophet said. But they said, you're not from our tribe. That nationalistic idea made them reject the truth and sadly, they also went a different path. So what you find is that we've got thousands of religions, but major ones, meaning Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, if you study them, they're all struggling within the parameters of good to be good. But you cannot hit bullseye unless God gives it to you. Allah says, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُ يَطْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ he it is who sent prophets from among you. What did they do? They recited the signs. They purified you. They taught you the law and gave you wisdom. And prior to that, you were lost. And before it, you were lost. Meaning Allah says, if I don't show you, you won't know. But if humans add and subtract from what Allah reveals, then you get all these varieties of religion. So according to Islam, there is only one deen. And to prove it further, that there was a trajectory of revelations towards mankind from Adam onwards, and they brought scriptures, they brought the law to you mankind based on their levels of maturity, that in the end, when the Prophet came 14 centuries ago, mankind was ready to receive the complete message. And all that came before it were the messages of Allah. Tawrat, Zabur, Injil were all messages of Allah. In fact, Isa salam, in the Bible says, I come not to abolish the law of Moses. I come to uphold it. Why uphold it? Because it's continuity. It's not a secret. So when Allah says, Ya uh, Rasul, Ballir ma unzil ilayka min rabbik, wa in lam taf'al, fa ma ballagta risalata, wallahu ya'asimuka min al-nas. O Messenger, deliver what has been commanded of you. Now this was in the last day, year of his departure. So Islam was fully established. What I mean by Islam, almost fully established, meaning Salah was instituted. Hajj was instituted. Halal and Haram was instituted. The Quran was almost entirely completed. The law was established. In Medina, all the fundamental pillars of Islam were established. Yet Allah is saying to the Prophet, lam taf'al. And if you don't do this, you have not delivered. What was it? It was the completion of leadership, the protection of leadership, the completion of this religion, which is the appointment of his successor, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. So what we find is that the Prophet Hajjatul Wida, when he stands in front of thousands of people, in Allah in Surah Al-Ahzab says, An-Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet has greater right on the believers than the believers have on themselves. And Nabi you awla. And the Prophet is asking the people in Hajjatul Wida, don't I have more right over you than you have over yourselves? They said, yes. He says, then I say to you, man kuntu mawla, fahada aliyun mawla. He holds the hand of Imam Ali alayhi salam and says, obey him because my obedience is his obedience. His obedience is my obedience. Lahmuhum lahmi. Same blood, we're one. Now, when the appointment took place, and the Prophet prays, and makes dua, and shows that the religion has been complete with leadership, because remember, the foundation of religion is dependent on leadership. You can never run a company without a leader. You cannot run an institution without a leader. No corporation can be without a leader, otherwise it's a headless creature. Even when Steve Jobs died, he was the vision of Apple. But you still need a leader. 
for then the company will go downhill without a leader. Leadership is essential in its start of the project, in its maintenance of the project, and its completion of the project. Hence the idea of the Prophet leaving us without a leader is ludicrous and absurd. That's why Allah says, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً I'm going to place on earth a khalifa. Here, ja'ilun is constant. There's never a time when the leader of Allah is not on earth. So when Imam Ali was chosen, then Allah says, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي Today I have completed my favor and perfected for you this religion called Al-Islam. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ Dina. This Islam is the Islam that Allah is talking about, that all of humanity has to struggle to come towards. So the notion to say that all religions are good in a pluralistic way is furthest from the truth. But human beings, even within their own religions, be it not Islam, while they are struggling to know the truth and to discover and uncover and to put more light and to elucidate their misconceptions to get closer to the deen of Allah, which is the central religion of God, that's a different matter. So our neighbors who may be of different faith, our obligation is to invite them and say, come, let's have a dialogue. Ta'alaw ila kalimatin, qul ya ahl al-kitab. Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. And la na'abuda illallah. Come, let's have a dialogue that we worship none other than Allah. This is the objective of a believer. What happens to such people? Be it Hindus, Jews, atheists, agnostics. Allah only knows where he will place them. You and I have no right to condemn anyone to hell. You and I have no right to call Hindus, Christians, Jews, as kafir, they're going to hell. It is forbidden for us to do that. We say 10 times a day, Maliki Yawm Din. Allah is the master of the day of judgment. Who authorizes us to condemn anybody? In fact, flip it the other way. There was a companion who died and the Prophet buried him. The Prophet did taqeem. And his relative was said, Oh, I see my beloved in paradise. So the Prophet looks at this person and says, How do you know that the one I just buried is going to paradise? He said, Ya Rasulullah, you buried him. You did the talqeen. Rasulullah says, I am not the shifa. Because I bury him doesn't mean that they enter paradise. Allah is the Maliki Yawmiddin. I do not have authority to bring anyone into paradise or to send them into hell. He doesn't have that authority. Allah is the master of the day of judgment. It is he who decides. Of course, the way of Rasulullah is the way to paradise. The way of Amir al-Mu'mineen is the way to paradise. But none of them have any authority on judgment day to do wasta. They say, he was my friend. You know, even if he was wrong, bring him in. No. On that day, Quran says nothing. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَطَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ Salim. On that day, your wealth, no, your family will help you. لا ينفعوا مالوا ولا بنون إلا منة الله The one who comes with a clean heart. Who is the clean heart? The one who struggles every day. Be it a Christian, be it a Jew, be it a Muslim. We struggle every single day to be honest and truthful. And while we are misguided, many of our generations preceding us were not believers in Islam. But our Former generations made a, a hardcore choice. Our grandfathers gave up some schools of thought, gave up some beliefs. They were even threatened with, with death. They were, they were chased and killed. But they took that direction in the way of Allah that you and I are sitting today as beneficiaries of that great religion, the Deen al-Haqq. لِيُذْهِرَ وَعَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّ The religion that is of truth that will supersede all. And it is the masterful religion that fundamentally it is so systematic that when we talk about Allah, there is no religion on earth. All theistic religions falls apart when it comes to pure monotheism except Islam. Even when I debate atheists, you find atheists have a very tough time debating a Muslim. Very difficult time. If you understand the logic of the oneness of God, no atheist can stand in front of you. It's a common sense argument, with all due respect. And I'm not here sitting on a pulpit telling you, I've been on the front lines for a long time, and I see it. 
But those who are atheists are confused, abused, misinformed. Their concepts are flawed. But what is our obligation then? To condemn them? I don't think so. I think our obligation is to invite them. Come, let's have a dialogue. Let's meet. When I met Dan Barker many a times, he would say, that makes sense. I haven't thought about that. Richard Carrier says to me, oh really? That's your philosophy? I haven't thought about that. Let me think about it. I think that's how we bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ Invite them to the way of your Lord with wisdom. وَالْمَوْعِدَةِ hasana, And with kind exhortation, not condemnation, not your kafir, not your najis, get out of my life. No. Or you're condemned to hell. No. Invite them. Sit with them. Talk to them. But many a times we don't. Do you know why? With all due respect. Because we ourselves don't know our religion very well. We're afraid. Like if I sit with this guy and he's going to ask me questions I don't know, then you know, it's not right. So you know what, let me just bury my head and say I'm right. You think Allah on Judgment Day will reward us for that? You know, blind faith is detestable to God. God will question us. On that day Allah will question us. He said, I gave you this mind. I gave you 124,000 prophets. I gave you the Quran. I gave you Ahlul Bayt. I gave you every scenario for you to think about. I gave you scientists. I gave you companions who were brilliant. How much time did you spend to know them? How much time did you spend to reflect on the authenticity of your faith? How much time did you spend that when you did sujood, you did it with compassion and love and recognized me? Or did you just do it because you were told that if you don't, you're going to hell? You know how many people worship Allah? Because they fear hell. I end with this. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali. Was the collection of 124,000 prophets put together in action as a reflection of prophets. That's why I love him so much. And when I would read his statements, it would make my spine shudder. For I've never, I have never seen, outside of the Qur'an and Rasulullah, words of wisdom that strikes the heart, that all philosophical arguments fall apart when such what we call lucid, perspicuous comments are made by the most learned human being after the Prophet. He says, Oh Allah, I don't worship you as a businessman for paradise. Nor do I worship you as a slave fearing hell. I worship you because you're worthy of worship. It's quintessential. وَإِذْ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٌ Allah has made a call in Surah Ibrahim. And we have made a calling to you. If you are grateful, we will give you more. If you are ungrateful, you deserve to be punished. The greatest form of ibadah in salah is to do takbirat al-ihram the way the prophets did, the way the imams did. Not because they were afraid of going to hell, because they felt the presence of God. That presence was so sublime that they didn't care what happens to them. Imam Ali alayhi salam in sujood, they would take the arrow out of his ankle for he could not even feel it because he is so in love with God. Not bargaining with God, but recognizing his enormous presence. You and I as Muslims are blessed. Let's go share that enormous gift of God to the rest of humanity. For Allah will hold us liable. And I'll discuss this further in Surah Surah Al-Hajj, verse 78. We have an obligation. And Quran clearly states that. We need to put it in action, inshallah. And inshallah, bit tawfiq billah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every one of us here struggles and in our trials and tribulations, Allah raises us higher and higher into stations. For you and I must struggle to reach the highest stations of paradise. While we must avoid hell, but the real struggle is not the avoidance of hell. The real struggle is the entry into maqam mahmood That's where you and I need to be. You and I need to see life as a glass that's half full. 
and let's fill it. And let's stop thinking as the glass that is half empty. For God forbid, we start to empty the rest of the glass. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى تعاتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقون بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته